Hello, this is James Berger with the Bakersfield Californian, and we are here with Off the Press. I'm here with my co-hosts, Nicole Parra, uh, CSUB faculty in political science, and uh, Russ Johnson, our government affairs uh, consultant here in town. And we are welcoming today our guest, Judge Corey Woodward. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, You're in a uh, campaign to uh, retain your seat there uh, in the uh, court in Mojave, and uh, so uh, it's it's actually a rare treat for uh, the political geeks in us uh, here to have a, a judge's race be as active as this one is, and so it's it's uh, it's it's I don't think a lot of people understand that that some judges are elected and that this is a elective process. So uh, it's a great chance to talk about jurisprudence in a political standpoint. So uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and so. Uh, I guess uh, tell us a little bit just to kind of uh, get started about the job you do and the court you you serve in and uh, kind of the position that uh, the work that you do out in, in this okay. court. All right, the um, you know, all judges uh, in superior court are uh, subject to being elected. You become a judge either by an appointment by the governor uh, or by election. And if you are appointed by the governor, eventually you have to stand for election every six years. Uh, typically in Kern County, I think as everyone's aware, there are not very many contested uh, uh, judicial uh, races. And uh, this year, of course, is, is different. So uh, when you are a judge for Kern County, you basically can be assigned anywhere in the entire county. Uh, I happen to be assigned out in East Kern. There's several, there's three, three of us that are, have lived in Tashpee for a long time. And uh, generally speaking, uh, of course, if you're that close to Mojave and to, to the Ridgecrest courts as well, is you end up getting uh, those, those assignments. But historically, my position um, and uh, the other two positions that have been out there, uh, whoever sat in those seats have been there. It's been probably over more than three decades that that, that I know of. So, um, uh, but but that does mean I can't get assigned uh, anywhere else as well, or anybody downtown can get assigned out there as well. But practically speaking, it doesn't work that way. Uh, yeah. So usually the judges that are serving East Kern live in East Kern, and that's that's been a historical fact as well. The types of uh, law that we do, uh, it runs the gamut. Uh, if you're down here in Bakersfield, you're typically assigned to uh, one area. You're assigned to family law. You're assigned to um, criminal law. You might be doing trials. You might be doing misdemeanors, felonies. You might be assigned to a civil law. And that tends to be the focus that you have um, when you're assigned downtown. Now, in the branch courts, it's completely different. Uh, different branch courts do different types of work. I think uh, out in East Kern, ours is the most expansive because you're responsible for everything from traffic tickets uh, on a daily basis uh, to, of course, misdemeanors and felonies. We do those every day, all week long. Family law is something that we do all week long as well, except for one day. And uh, then we do civil law as well, and that includes unlawful detainers, small claims cases, um, uh, breach of contract suits between people uh, who may be suing. And uh, so it's really a, a, it's a very varied uh, practice. So you have to be a jack of all trades as a outlying judge then, huh? Yeah, yeah a- absolutely. When I, w- my career was as a district attorney, a prosecuting uh, attorney. And when uh, I got assigned out to uh, East Kern, uh, I started out as a commissioner. Well, the first thing I had to do was learn about family law, and I've been, of course, a criminal lawyer for 16 years, and I said, family law? You know, what's, what's that? Uh, and uh, so you, l- but you learn. Uh, there's a learning curve, but you end up learning about it, and, and the civil side, too. I had to learn on that, that as well. So, Judge Woodard, tell me about your story and how you got into law, because I don't know too many people that, w- you know, when they start off as a young kid playing in the playground, that they say, oh, I'm going to be an attorney. How did you find that that pathway to go that direction? And then what was the trigger that made you say, hey, I want to become a judge? Okay. Um, you know, it's funny. I guess when you uh, – I, I was raised in this in Barstow, right? Barstow is a tiny town, and that, of course, was in – you got the 60s and the 70s uh, when I was being raised. So the world was a little bit different. You didn't have the exposure that you used to have or that kids do now in terms of who comes into the courtroom or into the classroom. And so uh, uh, what I ended up uh, 
uh, doing is, and it wasn't anything, a, a particular interest that I had in the law. Um, it, it, it actually coincided. My brother was six years older than, than I am, and he was in college at the time that I was about 13 years old. And he ended up, uh, that was his goal. He'd always come home and he'd say, hey, I'm going to be a lawyer. This is what I'm going to do. He was studying political science down at Long Beach State. And uh, at the age of 19, uh, he was killed in a car accident. And that's the first thought I remember about uh, how perhaps I was coping with my brother's death. I said, you know what, that was his dream, and then maybe I'll, I, I will f see that his dream ends up being fulfilled. And that's kind of how I got started in that direction. And of course, I was 13 at the time, but high school and college, that's sort of where my interest was. And so that's how I, how I got in, in, in into the law. Um, then, once you get into law school, um, you, of course, you have all kinds. You, uh, you're, you're studying all ty different types of law, and the uh, uh, criminal law, of course, is the most exciting. And I remember thinking at the time, you, you, you go home, and what do you watch? You watch Hill Street Blues, or you watch some lawyer's program, and that's what's exciting about life, and it was exciting. And when you were studying something like property, and, you're s and they're talking about something like a rule against perpetuities and, and something of that nature, which I couldn't even explain now. It has something to do with 25 years, but uh, you know, not being able to control property for 25 years. Yeah, that stuff was dry. It was much drier to me, and, and I just really enjoyed the criminal law. So uh, finally, when I got into, um, uh, got through the law school and, and uh, started my career here in Kern County at the district attorney's office, uh, then, of course, there was the experience of going in front of the judges, and, I th and uh, over time, I think the, uh, the demeanor and the behavior of judges uh, have changed. Um, you know, there was there's the old-fashioned judge I think everybody's probably familiar with, uh, the hard, hard judge who's going to yell and scream at you in the court, and uh, we had some of those uh, historically, and I just remember the, the stress. It's, there was a stress of, of putting on and going through trials. Uh, it meant you know, you're coordinating your witnesses, you're worried about the judge who wants to be on time, you're worried about the church. There's all this stress that's going on during a trial. And I just, I remember at one time saying, look, you know, th when you're, um, I, I just thought I wouldn't, if I ever have an opportunity to become a judge, I'm going to be substantially different. I don't think the judge needed to add to the stress of the courtroom for the lawyers, for the witnesses, uh, or for the, for the jurors. And I mean, I can remember stories of you know, jurors coming and saying, hey, do you know this judge? He, he said this, and he said this, and he said this to me. And I, I was always thinking, my gosh, you know, I don't think that's how it should be. And, and so that's how I ever thought. I wasn't really planning on being a judge at that time. And then uh, I had been working in, uh, uh, one, we moved to, to, to Tehachapi from Bakersfield, my wife and family. And when we were, um, when I had been out there, again, assigned to the DA's office, uh, a commissioner spot came open, and one of the, two of the judges actually had said, hey, we think you would be a good uh, uh, addition to the bench here as a commissioner. Uh, you know, would you be interested, and would you apply? And so I applied, and I, I honestly didn't know if I would ever be a good judge, and I think the, f the family would l laugh about it too because I said, I don't like to make decisions, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> you know, whatever you put down, that's fine. Where do you want to go? I don't care. What movie? I don't care. You know, it just, uh, I didn't like making the decisions, and I thought, well, you know what? If you get the position and you find out that that happens to be something, uh, a weakness, then you can, uh, you know, you can just say, hey, uh, I don't think I'm very good at this, and I need to move on. And so what I ended up uh, finding out, surprisingly, was on the bench, uh, I could make the decisions. I was very comfortable once I've listened to everybody and have studied and, apl and applied the law. I felt very comfortable uh, uh, in that position. So. Do you still remember, uh, as a commissioner, the first case that you uh, heard? I don't know if I remember <laughs> the very, very first. Right. I, I can remember parts of days. And, of course, out in East Kern, you have a relatively small uh, uh, 
practicing the, the lawyers, a small group of lawyers that are practicing. And so now all of a sudden the lawyers that you've been working with right. forever and pretty closely and you know them pretty well, suddenly you're I in a different position. And I can remember the first day of that family law because you, you have a calendar of like 40 cases in there. And I'm sitting here thinking these guys have been practicing, guys and gals have mm -hmm. been practicing forever. And, and uh, here I am and I'm just kind of learning. But I, I can remember, uh, I can certainly remember days like that. And I never have ever gotten used to uh, the other thing that mm -hmm. I remember from that first day is you put that robe on mm -hmm. and then you walk through the door and you walk to the and you know somebody says the bailiff says mm -hmm. all rise mm -hmm. so people are are standing up and I'm sitting here thinking everybody's looking at me kind of a thing and and so I just uh, uh, you know really even to this day mm -hmm. as soon as that that first walk in it isn't you know the most uh, the most comfortable I, it, it almost seems. Um, unlike me, I guess, mm. is, is how I would describe it. But yeah. uh, uh, one of the things is I know that we in any situation where you have ex expertise and you have good information, you're a little bit more confident. Is that kind of what you fee what how what your experiences on the bench has been? You've got you understand the law and you understand the rules, and as because of that, even though you might not think you know you're a leadership type person you're you kind of adapt to that that leadership role that decision making role that you talked about yeah what was that growth like that was mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. my question Jane. yeah the, the it's uh it, it has been interesting because uh, again going in uh, on the criminal side that's just a matter of kind of getting a, a different vocabulary down so that didn't create any kind of uh, of stress but then Wh when you're dealing with, say, for example, family law, and suddenly people are coming in here with these family problems, and some of these family problems are significant, uh, you're sitting there, whoa. But it, what it would involve for me was, you know, I spent a lot of time studying, and I went to a lot of seminars, training. I spoke with the, the judge that was out there, Judge Oglesby, who helped me a great deal. In terms of, I said, look, this is what's kind of come up. You know, how how do you view something like that? And so gradually, I, I'll, I'll bet it took pr probably um, maybe three years before I really started feeling comfortable uh, to that to that extent. Um, but and then even now, I mean, I feel very comfortable in terms of any issues that would arise. But uh, I'm telling you, some cases come in, and you think you would have heard, and then I'm yeah. talking particularly family law, domestic violence, uh, the civil harassment restraining norms, but in those, pr primarily the domestic violence and family law, you, it, it's like there, there are not enough variations. It's like pi, you know, 3.14, and the numbers go on forever. That's what, uh, it, that's what family law seems like. And you wouldn't think, you, okay, it's a divorce. Mm -hmm. Kids are getting separated. You have to figure out visitation. You have to figure out custody, figure out support. And it's not uh, always that easy because sometimes you're, uh, I, mean, I just remember a case the other day, and I'm looking at the two, and I'm saying, holy cow, you know, how, how, uh, how do you end up resolving this? You resolve it the best that you can because there's not always a perfect answer. And, and I always... With people that are in the courtrooms, I, th I think a lot of times you um, uh, you have a problem, and in your attempt to solve the problem, it only is exacerbated in some fashion. And sometimes you have to kind of corral everybody and get them back in. So it, it, it was really, in terms of the growth, it, gro it gets to this point, but you never know everything because it's not that you don't know the law, it's the situations that change. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Fascinating. You touched on the fact that you've had to deal with civil cases as a judge out in East Kern. What is th that's different because there are two different sets of law between criminal and civil, and you know, in some cases, you're dealing with property disputes between landowners or uh, disputes over uh, contracts. How how is that different, and how did you have to adapt to that? Because you're you're, you're dealing with, you know, you were a DA, you came from the criminal side, how and how does that experience help you? in your decision making? The, um, the, the civil is a lot different. Y when you're in the, on the criminal side, you, there, there's a lot of push in terms of the dates. You, things have to be done. You have speedy trial rights, and these things, ha you're go, 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 going. In the civil practice, it's a little bit, it is substantially different. There is no speedy trial. Things can go on for a long, long, long time. 
uh, you're dealing, uh, at least on the uh, in criminal side, typically you're always dealing with the lawyers, and that's a whole other uh, uh, set of skills than it is when you're dealing with uh, people who are representing themselves. And out in East Kern, th that we have a substantial amount of people who represent themselves. Uh, whether it's uh, you know on the civil side, I'm including things like small claims and unlawful detainers, uh, and uh, so in those types of cases, it's a it becomes a people skill. And you what, what you're trying to focus on as any judicial officer is is uh, having the everybody has access to the court. They have to have an opportunity to speak and to feel like they've uh, um, gotten their say and, and and to be heard. And so you, you end up uh, developing a whole other set of skills because some people want to be heard for a lot longer than the court uh, ends up having. And so you have to develop. And a lot of that is, uh, is people skills uh, in East Kern. And it's, it's a matter of how comfortable you are with people, how comfortable you are speaking with them. And um, um, just, uh, I mean, to me, a lot of it is just if you're decent and you're courteous, and you and you speak with them a lot. I think p it satisfies the substantial percentage, you know, ninety percent or more. And there's always people, of course, that that are unhappy. But you do the best that you can. And uh, what is the relationship between um, judges and community resources? So you, especially in family law, you're dealing with um, drug issues, um, domestic violence, and assistance. How is the relationship in East Kern with working with the judicial system and assisting children or families um, with resources that they need? And is there a, a need for more resources? Uh, we heard uh, Judge Vega came to my class and talked to the students about the juvenile justice system, and it's unfortunate um, that there aren't as many resources. We think from the governor we might have some resources, especially for um, those um, youngsters who we don't want to send to adult prison. What are some of the resources you have in East Curtin, and how is the judges, what, what is the role there for a judge? Yeah, well, it with the obviously the resources I think in everywhere. Mm -hmm. Number one, they're limited. They're never you, you don't have enough. Uh, in uh, if drugs end up becoming an issue, in in many times you're the judge out there. We're having to s uh, to establish an order where a person would go through a a mm -hmm. counseling a drug counseling program, but it's not something that. Um, um, like we don't have a drug counselor who there, who would be right there. You need to go to room you know 202, mm -hmm. and you need to start that process. Instead, it's this is what you have to do for uh, you know for you to whatever it is. I, mean, I, I, I keep thinking of family law terms, but mm -hmm. for you to get additional visitation or for you to satisfy the security concerns that your uh, ex-wife has, y you've got to go in here and you've got to be able to come in here and tell me, not just say, hey, judge, I've been. I've been dry uh, or sober for this long. I, I have to have something. Counseling ends up being the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, w there's, uh, you know, we have lists of, of providers for uh, the programs that exist, you know, the, the drug programs that do exist. So you, you, you send them off and you just, in essence, you monitor it mm -hmm. to, to see uh, how they're responding to it. Uh, so it's a, um, it's a difficult process from the bench's standpoint because a lot of the people that come before us, y they need more direction than yeah. just go. Mm -hmm. you know, go here. <laughs> right. And so we have those. Go fix yourself and then. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. So it, it and sometimes you'll probably see the same people coming back with the same issues and revisiting orders from the court, um, taking up court's time. Right? Yeah, no, a yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, the the drug, when you're in the drug, you just realize that people are going to, um, they're, th they're going to have those problems, they're going to have their relapses, mm -hmm. and you take all that into consideration. And I think, f you know, basically from the time I began as a DA, when we were sending people to prison for possession of methamphetamine to today, where methamphetamine and heroin and those are, are misdemeanors, there has been a substantial change, uh, outlook change, uh, to for for people and so you um, you take that in, in into consideration so it's it has been it's just been an interesting uh, evolution particularly in, in, in the drug field mm -hmm. and then you get the uh, 
Uh, you know, and then on the other side, the family side, where you have the counseling and the domestic violence in particular, y um, uh, you know, a lot of times I do think it comes down to the heart of the individual. You know, you're going to stop using the drugs or stop using the alcohol when you really want to, realizing that, you know, that it's not going to be easy. Or, or on the domestic violence side as, uh, as well, it, it, there has to be that change and and. At least uh, the good news is that when they, when we do send them to the programs, the people who have gone and are serious about fulfilling the obligations, the, then they, uh, it, it does seem, it does seem to help. All right, yeah. um, and that's that's the first segment. We'll have a, we're going to be back with uh, Judge Corey Woodward very soon, uh, in a couple of minutes. But uh, we're going to take a break here on off the press. <laughs> 